Hello and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. Today, we are talking about Roger's drums. And this is a really cool episode because I've got not only one expert, but two experts who are going to be on the show. We're going to start off with Mr. Poe Shai, who is going to take us through early Rogers. Poe, how are you? Hey, Bart. Good to be with you today. It's great to be with you, too. We actually met at the Chicago Drum Show um, in person, and I met you and Jeff Burke, who's going to be picking up the later half of Rogers. But we're both Ohio guys. Um, We're not very far apart. So you're based out of Columbus, right? I live in uh, Columbus area um, and work in Columbus. And I've lived in Columbus uh, most of my life, except for four years in Northwest Ohio to college. So uh, I'm an Ohio guy. So um, we got a lot of ground to cover today. So why don't we just uh, get started and I'll let you take us through the beginning of Roger's drums. Obviously, the story for Roger's drums doesn't start in Ohio as much as I'd like to maybe rewrite history and (laughs) and, uh, go there. But uh, the Rogers company in its heyday, uh, really, uh, people think of Ohio and and certainly we'll have time to talk about that. But uh, the Rogers Drum Company got its start in New York State. And uh, in 1859, and there wasn't uh, a drum to be seen in the Rogers factory at that time, they made drum heads. And it was uh, for some time in 1849, to put that in perspective, uh, Ohio was a state for basically about 45 years by that time. So this was still the frontier at that time. So uh, New York was a little more established. And uh, Joseph Rogers actually started the company in Dublin, Ireland, and uh, learned the trade of what's called tucking of caskins. We would call it tanning here in the States. And uh, he did the caskins for use for banjos, which were uh, an instrument used by Irish and others, as well as uh, drum skins, uh, drum heads. So he concentrated on quality drum heads. And uh, he brought his trade and his idea to, and his company and family name to United States. And then later on, he brought uh, his children in. Uh, The two sons uh, that everybody talks about are Joseph Rogers, Jr. And then uh, his grandson, Cleveland S. Rogers, uh, he took over the company in 1929. So there's a couple of different places. And uh, one, it was known to be founded in New York. uh, But New Jersey also plays a big part in it because... Uh, New Jersey is also a place where they manufactured the drums uh, starting in the mid-30s. The name of the town there was Farmingdale. Hmm. Now, if you go to Farmingdale, New Jersey, sadly, there's not much uh, to be seen there. Uh, There's no signage. There's nothing there to, you know, to denote that Rogers actually was there in a functioning company. And then Cleveland Rogers, he saw an opportunity to expand the Rogers name and, and basically diversify early on at that point, just to clarify, they were just making heads. They were doing just the tucking early on, right? They hadn't started making drums. Okay, cool. And you have to understand that they were at the the very top of their game. Uh, They were given a couple of citations, uh, gold medals at world expositions, which were popular back in that century. Uh, and when the company passed to Junior, uh, Joe Junior, and then finally to his grandson, Cleveland Rogers, in 1929, and you may remember from history that was the year of the Great Depression. Yes. So if you think about diversification and survival and those kind of things, by the mid 1930s, uh, Rogers were producing drums in their New Jersey factory. So when we think about uh, drum making, uh, drum making then was probably a little bit like it is now, where you have a major manufacturer of hardware and a lot of people using that hardware and then different people sourcing the shells and then doing some assembly. And of course, the hallmark of the Rogers drums at that time were their uh, calfskin heads. They were thought to be the very best. So the early Rogers drums were part Gretsch, they were part Slimlin, they were part Leedy, and they had Rogers heads. And, uh, you know, 
it's difficult to find a Rogers kit from the mid thirties. And then you of course have the warriors where they were basically non-existent. If you find some of those, you're, you know, lucky. And, uh, they're not as collectible as the drums we'll talk about later. So the very first badge that we find on a Rogers drums, uh, by Joseph Rogers Jr. And son was the union brand. And uh, you may be familiar with those parts. They had little scalloped uh, badge, a really nice looking badge on the outside. And uh, those were made from 1938 until after World War II when the Eagle badge, which is more famous, we'll find those in Covington as well. But then the Eagle badge was brought into play in uh, 1953. So there's a lot of history there's a major shift. I, I call Rogers a tale of three different eras. And uh, there'll be people that will argue there's more than that, but uh, you'll hear me out on this. Sure. Uh, the East Coast era is New York and New Jersey. And then, of course, the great move uh, to Ohio, which we all think of with Rogers drums. And then the last era I'll call the modern era, which is you know the move to Fullerton, California, and then beyond which we'll get into a little bit later in the program. Sure. So can you explain a little bit more about what you mean by they were partially Gretsch, partially Leedy, partially, um, I think you said Slingerland. Explain that a little bit more. Well, let me give you an example. Uh, if you take a Rogers drum uh, made during the Cleveland S, and that's the grandson, Rogers era, mm-hmm. after, you know, mid-30s, up until he sold it in 52, if you had a three Rogers three star snare, and you compared it to a Gretsch broadcaster, the only differences are you would have Rogers heads on it, of course, and then the actual snare strainer, which probably would be a slinger one. And not until much later, uh, you know, if you looked at a, lot, a Gretsch catalog versus a Rogers, not much difference. Really? Okay. So if you if you actually had one of these uh, Rogers, early Rogers drums that was, you know, uh, made, we're talking about, then it would be a, like a street, a three star, they're called. It's almost identical to a Gretsch broadcaster, except for the throw. Gotcha. Okay, cool. And that was super common back then, but I, I had no idea when Rogers was making drums and wasn't, and their use of, uh, and the heads and all that stuff. So Cleveland Rogers, who's the grandson of the originator of Rogers Trump's uh, reached retirement, Cleveland had no children. And if you do research, uh, you're going to find a bunch of different dates of when Henry Grossman purchased Rogers drums from Cleveland Rogers. Uh, I've read 1952, which is the date I use. I've also read 1953. And if you go to Rogers USA, their webpage that says 1955. Yeah, that's what I see right now. So, yeah. yeah. So, uh, 1955 is a date we'll talk about. Maybe we'll talk about it right now. April 5th, 1955, at a Kiwanis Club in Covington, Ohio, after basically three years of product development and working on the product line, it was announced, and it was no secret because Covington was a town of 2,000 mm-hmm. people at that time it was announced that Rogers drums was in production. Well, they'd been in production for a while, but the date April 5th, 1955 was an infamy with Rogers drums as being the date that it started. But in actuality, Henry Grossman in 1952 approached Cleveland Rogers and purchased the Rogers uh, company. So he was acquainted with Joe Thompson and uh, those two, if you look at uh, our Facebook page, Covington drummers, they're, those two are pictured prominently on our page today because Joe Thompson was a Covington, Ohio native. He was like you and I, a, a, a Buckeye. Yep. <laughs> and uh, he agreed that he would help Henry Grossman, who was a, a great businessman and a, probably a marketing genius for his time. Those two together came together, and Joe Thompson was part architect. And, I mean, that literally by he designed the building. His home and workshop, the factory is basically right behind that. So uh, he built the factory, uh, hired all the local people, got it up and running, and then uh, Henry Grossman on the business side. Hmm. Wow. And so in 1955, they started cranking out what I would call 
the golden era of Roger's drums. So pre-1955, 54, 53, pre-mid-50s was owned by members of the Rogers family, such as Cleveland, which is kind of confusing because that's a city in Ohio, obviously. Yeah. But, it, is, um, it is confusing. We'll talk about the Cleveland era of Rogers drums in a minute. That's funny. Okay, so it's going to get more confusing. But all right, so pre-1955, it was owned by family members, but at that mid-50s point, Henry Grossman and Joe Thompson, they open up in Covington, Ohio, and are starting to make their own drum shells, right? Well, uh, that's not exactly true either. Their first shells were purchased by Jasper, okay, which was a, uh, a company in Indiana. And uh, you have to understand that Henry Grossman, as a businessman, was a jobber. Or what was and a jobber was somebody that basically purchased all the materials he needed. And that's basically how the drum industry has been, you know, from, from when they started building drums. Someone made the shells and sold them, and other people made the hardware, and you'll find that throughout the history of manufacturing, and especially drum manufacturing, which you're talking about. So uh, Henry Grossman owned a company called Duplex, as well as Rogers, and of course, uh, Duplex, he, he ended up uh, selling and Duplex drums after he actually sold Rogers, and going to get ahead of myself, but he was a jobber, and what he did under the Joe Thompson era of manufacturing was bring everything in house. Of course, he purchased the shells, but the lugs actually were made for a time at the Covington factory. Other products were made there. They uh, diversified. Other things were uh, jobbed out around the Dayton, Ohio. A lot of people think that Covington, Ohio is near where you're at mm -hmm. uh, in Cincinnati, but uh, Covington, Ohio is... Uh, basically 15 miles north of Dayton. Yeah. Which, um, that's a, an area, as you know, being from the state of Ohio, a large manufacturing area, especially then, very agricultural, but also a lot of manufacturing, and especially with the aviation industry. A lot of people that don't live in Ohio, or especially around Dayton, don't know about. So it's a natural fit. One interesting fact I would just say about Joe Thompson is, if you research the property on which the Rogers factory was built, it goes back to, to the American Revolution, his family, his ties to the Miami Valley and Miami County, where uh, Joe and his family lived. Also, which is interesting, a lot of different names of people that worked at the Rogers factory were actually Joe's relatives. You know, you'll see the, the assembly marks that were pulling the tags, but a number of those people had a lot of family ties there. Well, and it seems like, I'm sure, like you said, this is a small town, and I think that people there would love having a new industry pop up that would provide jobs. Did a lot of the people in the town start working in the, in the drum industry as soon as they moved in just to, to get a job? Yes, uh, a lot of people did. Uh, I would be remiss in not mentioning uh, Ben Strauss. Uh, he was, you know, basically Grossman Music was the parent company of Rogers Drums. Uh, ben Strauss was also a genius uh, in terms of marketing and was on the marketing side. And what those guys did was they brought in innovations that are still with us today. One, one example I'll, I'll talk about is Wahlberg and Ache is a hardware company you've likely heard of and many of our listeners have heard of. And prior to 1955, uh, Rogers was purchasing Wahlberg and Ajé, and you'll see it on the catalog all the way up to 58, a number of products that they produced. So the Rogers hi-hat stand, uh, the Swivel Bank 4401 and the 4402, when those things came out, they were revolutionary. Yeah. Uh, just because of the technology and the beauty of them, they could not make them or the Rogers uh, drum pedals, the uh, solid board, and the hinge TO models, they could not make them fast enough. So the innovations they came out with, adjustable by using a drum key, unthought of uh, yeah. before that time, the memory lock, another one of the things we'll talk about later, but these are revolutionary uh, things that we take for granted as drummers now. And, uh, you know, somebody my age, you know, that goes back a few years, some of these things, uh, with the consulates, those kind of things we lived with back when we were kids, but 
when the swivel Mac was introduced, it was almost breathtaking. Some people look at it with like, oh, that's just a fad, but other people realize what it was. And you'll see it in the early 60s when the British invasion of a lot of the different groups that used the hardware. Yeah, hardware is is extremely innovative. Um, so then with the hardware, Rogers, is that kind of their, um, they're obviously a well-known brand at that point in the drum world, but is that they're like, hey, we're here and we are a force to reckon with? Like that kind of puts them on the map or are they already on the map at that point? I think that um, you're talking about a drum company that is up and coming in the 50s. And by the time that it releases uh, the Dynasonic snare hardware, which was unheard of and revolutionary. And, you know, I know there'll be some Leedy guys who'll say, hey, you know, Leedy had that in 1938, and you know, if this guy would have lived. And, you know, we've heard all those arguments before, but the patent belongs to Joe Thompson. Uh, ben Strauss was instrumental in helping Joe, and there's other people. We're lucky enough to have somebody like Jerry Shields, who's uh, going to be 79 years old next year, but he's still very active and who I spend a lot of time with that has a prototype that he believes to be one of the very first out there. Wow. Joe Thompson was an inventor. He may have taken the idea that Levy had, but in the end, here is hardware that is still being reissued uh, to this modern day under the new reissue, and they sound amazing just like they did back then. So hmm. I think their innovation started uh, the minute they opened their doors in 55 because they had these innovative products. But I think they really hit their stride in the early 60s when you see, uh, you know, you have uh, music going mainstream with groups like the Beatles and the Who and Dave Clark Five and the Kinks and people like that. And then you see, you see modern music starting to take over where the gear is, it's all about the gear. Yeah. So I'd say the heyday is from 53 to 76 Okay. in my mind. And I, I think there's a lot of people that probably would agree with that. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I didn't know about Leedy having any involvement in the Dynasonic. Leedy is one of those drum brands that will live in the history of drums uh, and that stands on its own. Mm -hmm. And sure. uh, But if you take a look at Joe Thompson's early Dynasonic prototype that Jerry Shields has, uh, and you look at the 1938 Leedy that I've seen pictures of, they're very similar. So somebody was there, and I don't recall the name of the person um, responsible, and there's going to be people listening to this podcast like, dang it, Poe, you, <laughs> you should know that name. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah, I'm a Rogers guy, so sue me. But sure. um, I don't think there's any acrimony or ill feelings in our community. It's just that, like I said, Joe uh, has the patent. He's got the literally the dinosauric engraved on his gravestone yeah. uh, in Covington. It's what he's known for. Did he have some help? Yeah, there's no doubt. But Joe Thompson was somebody that had a, a very expansive workshop. That building still exists. It's in poor repair, but he spent hours upon hours working on musical instruments and research and development. Dinosonic is no different. Sure. So the fact that it's been reissued recently as 2017 and and has been in production again in the modern era for a couple of years, kind of speaks to the technology of that sound, uh, you know, without choking, you know, giving faster stick response, pinpoint definition. I mean, the projection, uh, the Dynasonic really put uh, Rogers on the map. Got it. And they're still making it. So very cool. Yeah. And their big thing was, you know, the original, like the Rogers lunch originally were drawn brass, you know, the bread and butter is kind of a famous, but they uh, they had issues. And, um, you know, the third round of Rogers uh, came out in the 64 catalog. Some of them probably a little earlier than that uh, is the famous beaver tail lugs that are being reproduced today. Yeah. Uh, and, and cosmetically, they basically stayed the same until the end of uh, their manufacturing period in the, the golden era and then on the Fullerton. And now today, they... Uh, reproduce uh, both a steel version of or a steel alloy version of the bread and butter uh, and they also the drums are being produced in the beaver tail so and those are springless you know so there's an evolution of you know the technology but the aesthetic of the of the lug still stays the same sure cool some of the other different things you'll find and uh, we talked about the Cleveland era or the Covington era 
is the tension rods being you know, the bow tie T rods, and then later on uh, the distinctive bat wing uh, design of quals and, and T's. Yeah. So there's there's a lot of interesting style cues that kind of date the Rogers drums to a specific time period, and what we call the Cleveland era is a interior paper tag that has Cleveland, Ohio written on it with the serial number up above it, and then and then the name of the the drum style. Hmm. And then uh, there's a later Dayton era that has the same tag, uh, only with Dayton, Ohio at the bottom of it. And then later on, we go to the Fullerton tags, which uh, there's several variations of that in terms of the actual color and size. Well, let me ask you then. So, okay, so we were, before, we were on the East Coast. We were New Jersey, basically starting in in Dublin, really, if you're going way back. Then we go into the New York, New Jersey kind of area. Then we're in Covington, Ohio. So what made them move from Covington up to Cleveland? Well, uh, you know, Grossman was a Cleveland guy. Okay. And uh, we're, we're lucky enough to have somebody like Don Friedman who worked for Grossman, uh, who's still alive and still kicking it up in Cleveland that's given us lots of great information between that and Jerry Shields. And then Phil Reed, our friend who lives in Dayton, who worked at the Dayton plant. So we have some people that are still with us that, you know, uh, here in Ohio that can give us the information that we need. So if you understand during the Cleveland era, there is uh, uh, Grossman, uh, Henry Grossman and Ben Strauss and Don Friedman and others in that office doing the marketing and the sales and the wholesaling aspect of Rogers drums and then duplex and then their other brands. You know, we could get bogged down and talking about Joe Thompson and the, sure. the actual toys that he sold and the different other products that, you know, Joe invented and sold. But Rogers itself was headquartered in Cleveland, Ohio, the offices and warehouse. So manufacturing done in Covington and then shipped to Cleveland. Huh. And then later, uh, after the sale of the uh, business from Grossman family to CBS, you know, uh, then you have manufacturing moving to Dayton, Ohio, late in the summer of 1966. Now, having said that, 1966 didn't mean stopping work at Covington. Approximately uh, 45 production workers remained at Covington, and then the office staff of 25. Now, later on, everything was moved, including manufacturing, to Dayton, Ohio. And that's where people get a little confused. And uh, one, the tags say Dayton. Were some of these drums made in Dayton? Probably most of them were made, the shells and everything, and, and the wraps and everything assembled at Covington. And there were probably uh, some drums assembled at the Dayton factory when they moved all the lug machines and everything up there for a short period of time, from what I've been able to understand. So CBS came in the picture and bought them and then said, we're going to keep it in Dayton for... I'm sure logistical reasons and all that stuff. Was it a happy purchase with CBS or was there some like bad feelings there? Or was that, was that all good? I don't think at first from what I will understand, I've talked to a number of uh, Rogers employees at Covington and call a lot of my friends. Um, I think it surprised them. Uh, it was a big family, a happy family and people just humming along doing great work. And uh, you know, a lot of diversity, a lot of women. Oh. Uh, working in that plant. And uh, a lot of those people knew each other, worshiped together, uh, you know, uh, as we say in Ohio, neighbored together, and uh, <laughs> which means fellowship, uh, that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, drank together, uh, you know, the whole, uh, the whole gambit. But I think that CBS, which was called Columbia Broadcasting Systems back then, later shortened to CBS. Uh, the warehousing, and uh, the shipping, it moved uh, to Dayton in late 66. So by the summer of 66, the plant still remained in Covington, but the actual shipping operation and their, and their office operation moved to Dayton. Now, the big move that everybody talks about is June of 69, and that's where the acrimony you're talking about may have existed because that's when they said, we're moving to Fullerton, California, 
there were several employees that left and went to Fullerton, but not very many. Most of the people were born and raised in Ohio, uh, and they weren't going anywhere. There was a burgeoning aviation uh, industry that needed workers, especially a trained workforce like the Covington Force would have been. And all those people found other jobs, they were just left with a bad taste in their mouth. I don't know that Henry Grossman knew that CBS was going to do, uh, I don't know if any promises were made, but I don't know that they knew that the, that was going to happen. Yeah, that he wouldn't have said, okay, do it. Go ahead and pull the rug out from underneath this town uh, that is pretty much reliant on Rogers at that point. Yeah. So a lot of those people, like I said, went to work in the aviation industry or uh, uh, other a lot of manufacturing in Dayton in, in, in the late 60s. So it was inconvenient, but I think all those people did find jobs and they moved on with their life. Hmm. So you go to Covington, Ohio today, there is a simple sign in front of the police station in the municipal building that says Covington, Ohio, you know, it's the shape of the Ohio, the state of Ohio. And it basically says Joe Thompson inventor of the flutophone, which is a plastic, looks like a small flute and most school kids in Ohio played that when we were in second or third grade. I don't know if you did or not, but there's no mention of Rogers anymore wow. is what I'm saying. Wow. Okay. So I'm sure it strikes you as odd as well, but it seems like there's so many people who have passion for Rogers and it's not getting as much love as it should from the community in, uh, in Covington. But obviously you're doing a great job. You're the, like, the ambassador of Covington keeping this, this story alive. Thank you for saying that. Uh, last year, uh, or like April, uh, we put on a drum show there that was uh, more successful than my wildest dreams. <laughs> and um, it was really fun. And uh, the, the community was very helpful and involved. And the uh, modern Rogers community, Rogers Drums, uh, sent the mayor a uh, new Dynasonic manufactured in in uh, California and sent it to us and I gave a little speech and after the parade and uh, I don't know it was uh, I think the town now realizes its legacy and they're doing some things to kind of shore up the legacy and the history portion of it which is good you know? oh, yeah 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 the one thing I want to talk about before we switch over to our friend Jeff who's going to take us through the uh, Fullerton California days uh, up to now is so let's talk a little bit about the drum sets that were going on then. I mean, there was a lot of big players. Like I just did the biography of Buddy Rich. He had a period with Rogers. Lots of big drummers were using Rogers. So what were the drum sets like then? I mean, obviously we have uh, it was it was a jazz era. So, but they were they were very popular. Not only the Dynasonic, but the kits were were beautiful. Well, I think that uh, the kits themselves uh, are like time machines, and you see a lot of resurgent. Uh, and vintage kits uh, being played out. Uh, most notably would be uh, Harry Henson that plays uh, for Marty Stewart. He is a Rogers. And of course, he's not endorsed by Rogers, but uh, a lot of the kits that he has uh, come from members of uh, our Rogers community. And and uh, Matt Chamberlain is playing a Rogers kit. Yeah. But uh, the difference types of kits. Uh, the Celebrity was a setup that included a Dynasonic snare, uh, a 20 or a 22, and then a rack tom of 13 or a 12, and then a floor tom. And then, of course, uh, the Rogers hardware was a big thing. The, the stands, all uh, swan leg stands were a big uh, seller, but there was also the Rogers Timbali twins, Roy uh, uh, Cochran and the CC Riders, they made those famous with twin drummers playing the uh, Timbali twins. Wayne Cochran created quite a stir when he came to the, uh, the Covington plant. He was way ahead of his time. Platinum blonde hair, wore makeup. And uh, yeah, really. people in Covington, really, they didn't really know what to do with him. <laughs> uh, Jerry still likes to tell that story. I love to hear it. That's funny. Uh, Louis Belton and his twin bass set uh, is probably one of the most famous uh, yeah. Rogers endorsers leaked in my mind. Uh, as a young player in 1971, I got my very first double bass uh, set. Uh, I I used uh, two rack toms instead of one like Louie. But uh, at that time, you know, uh, you had a lot of 
older guys that were into the jazz swing big band thing turning over the reins to young rock musicians and uh, young you know young rock and jazz players uh, one of my favorite setups is the is the cozy coal uh, it goes well back in the Rogers lineup from the very beginning cozy was uh, somebody that stepped in as an endorser early in uh, his, uh, you know, Rogers, uh, as soon as they started making them, his setup uh, is probably one of the most famous that, you know, with the uh, Dynasonic or Power Tone, 22 inch bass, a Rack Tom 13 and a 16. And then uh, the Cozy Cole that they sold a lot of didn't necessarily match what Cozy actually played or the Buddy Rich or the Dave Clark. But they modified the kits to what was selling out in the marketplace. Like the Dave Clark kit, for example, uh, his kit was the Londoner kit, which was, they sold a lot of those kits. But Dave's kit, the Rack Tom setup, was not exactly like the one that they sold from Rogers. Hmm. And uh, Roy Burns' Starlighter kit, which is a very simple kit. So as someone who is a fan of Rogers but doesn't know yet, everything about it because uh we're still working on that right now but um the logo and the badge and the you know the logo on the bass drum that's a good way to date rogers drums right yes it is we started talking about the original uh badge which would come from i would call it the union uh badge or the union made drums and um those go back to uh i want to say they were introduced to like in the late forties. That was the first badge put on by, uh, the union brand. And, uh, I'd say that was introduced around 1938. And then after world war two, you had the Eagle badge and they were put on drums back in 48, 1948. So the script badge that we all know and love, and that's probably the most famous one is 1953 when they were first introduced. And uh, then later it was changed to the large square badge with a script R over the air hole. It brings us into the modern era, which Jeff will talk about. Yeah. Uh, there's some different variations of the script badge. You know, there's the pirate badge that was produced one year only. And uh, there was a one year that uh, the badges were bigger than others. But for the most part, the script badge is the most enduring and and you'll find it on most Rogers models, that, especially the popular ones that people are uh, restoring and playing today. Man, that's great. The script logo definitely just, it just grabs you. And it looks it looks different. And you just see it and you go, wow, that's cool. That's vintage. That's very sharp. And I love it. So, and, and I also want to say to you, unrelated to the, to the badges, that um, the Rogers community is so strong and is so welcoming and inviting to everyone. Um, I think that it's just, it's what drumming and the community is all about. There's a lot of love there. And I appreciate you saying that. Um, Bill Ward uh, mentioned that to me when he stopped by. And of course he, you know, he's not somebody that has a lot of uh, Rogers in his background, but he connected with us in our community and, um, I, I think that it was interesting that he mentioned that, and he later reached out to me and, on uh, Facebook Messenger and said something. And, I, and th- that meant a lot to me, as along with your comment. That, that That's kind of a byproduct of, uh, I think, of what comes out of the Covington era, really, is that uh, family kind of thing, and, and then you know, a lot of camaraderie in the Trump community to begin with, and then... I think you see a lot of that at the Chicago show. Absolutely. And without further ado, I'm going to turn the rest of this program over to my dear friend and uh, a recognized Rogers expert, Mr. Jeff Burke. Welcome to the show, Jeff. How are you? I'm doing absolutely fantastic, and I really want to thank everybody, and you especially, of giving this wonderful opportunity to share our energy and our passion with the Rogers folks. We're here in, uh, in Texas at what we call the Rogers Drum Silo, or the Rogers Burke Um, collection. And we just want to have this opportunity to uh, share our passion with everybody as Poe has. And thank you for uh, uh, leading it on uh, to me. And I hope I can handle uh, and and give whatever information you need. And and we just thank you. We're very grateful for that. Thank you very much. Awesome. Well, um, can you just give us a quick kind of recap on where we were and then just take it on through the CBS uh, Fullerton days? Yes, they were in they were in Covington. And, um, 
they started moving everything to Dayton about that time. And um, so uh, um, a lot of the stuff was in the Cleveland warehouse and uh, they were moving from Cleveland and, and they were still doing construction in Covington. And uh, so when it got to Dayton, which was a total crazy thing, because uh, when Jerry Shields went there, along with a few other folks, uh, which a lot of people didn't go, uh, what they ran into was manpower hmm. help. Really, the people didn't know anything about anything. No, and there was a lot of back orders and and stuff. And and uh, basically, they uh, the whole idea with CBS was that that uh, they were they, they had quick plans to move everything to Fullerton, probably anyway. Hmm. I was I'm sure it was already in their scope. Not only that, because you know Fender Rhodes is there, and everybody they're already there. Baldwin. A lot of other companies that they owned. AMF, uh, they owned a lot of companies. I don't know exactly the total, what it was, but it was an umbrella underneath all kinds of other music companies Got it. that they had. And um, so when, when, when the unfortunate uh, uh, heartbreaking of Joe Thompson happened and he passed away um, due to everything, he felt like the carpet was completely pulled out from underneath him soon after they moved everything from was boxed up and moved to uh, Fullerton in 69. So basically what, what all had happened was um, when the move was made from Covington to Dayton, CBS plans, I'm sure, because the stay in, in Dayton and Dayton was very, very limited. Uh, it was only a few years. Yeah. And uh, they were already moving in 66, but imagine basically 67, 68, and then leaving in 69, you know, and, and then we'll find out later down the road on how much Fender actually moved nine times, nine yeah. times wow. this company, nine times. And they went from California to Mexico several times, not just once, but twice. Hmm. So when, when Joe Thompson passed away uh, in 68, they packed everything up and moved it to Fullerton, California. Uh, when they went to Fullerton, California, Dan Davis was went there and, and had signed a one lease, one year lease on his apartment and uh, or his place to stay, and um, and to help them set up their production line. Well, the two gentlemen that were sent there, as I understand, they uh, they were well versed in what to do with Rogers hmm. at that time, and they were sent there from up north somewhere and with a very heavy New York accent. <laughs> and uh hey how you doing you know and <laughs> and uh and they were like how you doing and what are we doing hey how you doing what are we doing yeah. you know yeah and uh here they were barrels of drums te you know tension rods lugs all kinds of stuff setting it up so he set up the line and everything and after one year dan davis came back to ohio he says i'm not staying hmm. So there was a lot of discrepancies happening at that time, but they were building great drums. And uh, a lot of these great drums, what happened was, is uh, there's also drums, as we know, there's a solid gray interior that were drums that were built in Covington. And then we also know that there's a speckled mm -hmm. um, shell inside that was also built in Dayton. Well, it just so happened that some drums that were solid and gray ended up in Fullerton with Fullerton tax. Hmm. You know, yeah. actually were speckled, speckled, not Fullerton tax, excuse me, but they were speckled interiors, but they were actually, you know, drums coming from Covington area. So then you have some confusion there where it was just hard to tell. It's, so it, does that make it hard to date the exact, uh, you know, those well, drums? Uh, the, the dating has been basically over the years, we've been able to uh, dial in these drums. Okay. Because we just looked basically at, you know, the um, the shell itself and, and solid gray tells the story coming. Got it. And then also Dayton. But, you know, things with solid gray going such a, a, a limited time, going from Dayton to Fullerton, it may have still solid gray, you know, and it is what it is. Yes. Yeah. Uh, leftover merchandise, let's sure. say. Absolutely. Okay. What they did going from one to the other CBS did a lot of things under their umbrella now to basically, um, let's say, 
make it easy on construction or configuration of the bass drums and what they're going to put together. Hmm. So now let's say we have, uh, uh, we had many different configurations on the drums coming out of Covington's, which were so special. Um, we had the celebrity, which is, you know, three swivel mounts, two on, two on the left and then one on the right. Uh, and then we had the swing time, which is two swivel mounts, which is one on the left of the tom, one on the right for the disappearing cymbal arm. And then we had the headliner, which is a cymbal tom mount on the left, and then a, a knobby on the right. And then, of course, we had the top hat, which is a single arm going right straight down the middle with two toms connected up. But it's swivel. Okay, mm -hmm. and uh, and there was a few other things that they had. There, there, you know, some other little configurations. Those are the mainstays that we know of. And then there's other things that came up, which basically were special orders, which is a, a celebrity type setup, which is, again, we call it a buddy rich, sure. uh, which is basically the uh, two tom mounts, two swivel mounts on the left, one swivel on the right where the symbol disappears. But then again, they put a top out swivel in the middle so that you either put a simple mount there or you can put two toms and use the other two for something else. Or we could call it a cozy coal, you know, yeah. it's, it, it, where you can mount the snare to the bass drum. So what happened was with all these wonderful configurations, what they did, they got rid of them. Okay. So there's another thing that they put a tom mount in the middle of the bass drum, double tom mount. Okay. So they got rid of all of having to drill things out and, you know, and all that stuff and having more people doing more. So they're figuring ways to let's cut down on, uh, let's say labor. Sure. Um, and material, chrome plating, screws, fasteners. Imagine how many fasteners we were talking, uh, talking to the wonderful Jerry Shields about this. And he goes, Jeff, we ordered, 25,000 fasteners in a week. <laughs> yeah. In a week. Wow. Yeah. Would you imagine? Okay. Hey, how you doing? Yeah, I came here to apply for a job. Yeah, have a seat. What do you do? Hey, well, I'll just put you in. It's a great job. Go, go there in the fastener department. Okay, no problem. Take over there. What are you going to do? You're going to put all these on those. See you oh, later. Man. Have a nice day. Yeah. You know? And, uh, well, you know, there's one thing, though, is that the Covington people had a great family. Mm-hmm. And that's what really missed all the way around from some folks that want to understand underneath Joe Thompson and even Grossman, they love their people. Yeah. They love their people. Yeah. And they have parties and everything. They love their people. All that went away. They went to Dayton. The people got clipped at their knees in Covington when they moved. So when you go from Covington family, Dayton manpower, and then you go to, hey, how you doing? I'm from Fullerton now, you know? <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, uh, you know, you go to that. And then there was other things that cut corners, like the Dinosonics. They took the, you know, the, um, they cut the, the, you know, basically the bottom frame. You know, there's things that disappeared there. Uh, the, you know, the, the elastics that kind of bring the frame up, which is something that uh, Ellis Tolan and, and along with, uh, of course, Joe Thompson, top of that. And Buddy Rich had a little bit to do with that. And about the snare frame not bouncing around, so they put the elastics on it. Hmm. And, you know, there's uh, – so all these things disappeared. The frame became one solid solid piece without all these attachments on it and to be able to do the elastics. The hoop on the bottom became one single hoop, okay? But that, you know, going into basically 72-ish, you know? So uh, the couple of years that they spent in, in Fullerton – just trying to dial things in, things started to change and they were starting to cut corners. Not saying cut corners, doing away so that they, um, that, that wouldn't be a good word, cut corners. I think, well, yeah, maybe so. Uh, but in a way to kind of like make things a little simpler. Sure, okay? sure. So now they call that drum set up. They don't say, oh, that's a Covington this, that, or the other, or a headliner. They say, oh, so it was made in Fullerton, period. Got That's it. where it is. Are those less sought after than the Covington? If for a collector, would those be less desirable? Well, well, the thing is, is that we have. Let, let me put it this way: you know, when you're in Covington, you have three ply drums at the beginning, and you have five ply drums, mm -hmm. sixty-three to sixty-four. Okay? okay, so then, all in a nutshell, you know, yeah, I mean, you know, the hardcore collectors, the people coming in, they're going to want these. What, what do you got? Hey, you ought to see my baseball card. It's a swing time. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I like that swing time, you know? Yeah. Well, what do you got? I got a Fullerton. Hey, yeah, that's cool. You know? Hey, sure. Well, let me show you my headliner. Yeah. You know, and, and, and so, yeah, yeah, you know, 
but I have Fullerton setups here, and, and let me tell you, they're great drums. I'm sure. Yeah. You know, we can't can't beat that up. You know, but they are great drums. Are they more sought after? Eh, well, you know, we have different communities. Okay. You know, yeah, we have different communities. Uh, some of the hardcore people do like the, you know things coming out of Covington, and there are some people that you know they just love the Fullertons and because of the solid blacks and those, and, you know, and you got, you know, whites and, and there's some other colors that, that they came out with that. Some people just like that double Tom setup, yeah, you know, they, got it. they did in that. They just like that double Tom setup and that that's cool. Um, and then when we go from there, you know, we, we have different type of uh, tags on the drums, uh, the tags coming to Fullerton, you know, they came with the square tag, just like they did in Dayton or in Covington. And uh, even before then, you know, it was a lot of square tags. And, you know, things changed as they went along. They they started making, in 72, they came out with these uh, elongated tags. And they had an A on it or a B on it, you know, as, as the year was different. And then at the end, they ended up just stapling these tags. So there's no more glue, just, <laughs> you know, with a staple gun. Really? You know, and then, the, and then it, yeah, yeah. And then you get a, and then I'd go find a Tom and say, oh, that's great. And I looked underneath and I hear a noise. That's the tag is floating around inside the top. Because it fell you know? off. Wow. And, yeah. And, and, yeah. So that was, that was, you know, it wasn't a problem with the drum. It was a problem of cutting the corner. Hmm. They were cutting the corner. Can you explain a little bit about what, what year are we in right now that we're talking about? Okay. We're in, okay. We talked about, we're getting into Fullerton in 69 and 70. And when they first moved to Fullerton in those years that they came out, there was, there were some problems with, uh, with the lugs and stuff like that, because, you know, you go into one place and then you're changing platers, you're changing it, you know, the whole game, mm -hmm. you know? So they had, they had some problems with lugs and everything going into there, going into that, you know, workmanship, let's say a little bit of problem with the, with the re-rings, you know, they weren't attaching right or something. Some were like boing, 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 coming apart on the inside, <laughs> yeah. you know? And uh, so, you know, we're talking about 69, 70, you know, going into that, that year. Okay. And 72 things got a little better. Okay. okay. Uh, 72 things got a little better. They did cut a little bit of corner. I didn't like the way they put the rectangle badge in there. Mm -hmm. You know, it was glued on for a little bit. And then at the end, they ended up stapling it. And uh, that, that was a total different deal. Going in, going into that part then, um, 72, 73, 74, I've got some nice snares from that year. Okay. They are just a hoop bottom on them. You know, you go into basically with the Dinosonics, when you come out of a Dinosonic out of, out of the early years in Covington, they had bread and, they had bread and butter. They were real majestic. They had tall hoops on them. Well, they looked like a king's crown, hmm. you know, yeah. and they were Dinosonics. So you go, and, and that's in early like 61, 62, where those were Gratz shells. Those shells were made by George Way, you know, coming in. So then things started to change when George Way left. Gretsch shells disappeared in 61-ish. So then you go, you go into, and I, I'm really into the Dinosonics. And um, I have a huge Dinosonic timeline here. And, uh, and there was other drums that were made, too, that were made of brass, naked brass. Hmm. I mean, that seven lines that, you know, there's only like one or two ever. Yeah. And uh, so, and, and that's the holiday line. But anyway, so that when you start, Going into the Dinosonic era, things changed going into 1969 a little bit. They're still really nice. They're beautiful drums. But, you know, then it changed to the hoop in 72, where things and the workmanship started to change a little bit in the drums. Okay? Got it. Yeah. Which was a good. It was good. They're good drums. So then when we went into 74, then we went into, we were starting to go into another era. Competing with the uh, folks making Tamas and Yamahas and all that stuff, yep. mostly Tama. Sure. Tama and other companies were imitating Rogers. So they came out with their line of concert toms, 1970. They're already in 70, 73, 74. We were having our, our, you know, our big setups, you know, with mm -hmm. the, uh, the power sevens, the power eights, the nines, the studio 10 and all that stuff. So in 75 Rogers came out with a line they did. Uh, it's called, um, big R. It had a, uh, a lot of folks didn't like the big R they dropped the script and they went into big R. So when they went into big R, they wanted to compete 
with this big label and, you know, and everything, but, uh, because Tam was the Japanese, you know, market was mm-hmm. really was killing everybody. But the only the crazy thing about it is that Rogers came out with a, uh, with a design called memory lock. Well, that memory lock design, absolutely amazing. Absolutely the best design you'd ever think of in drums. Why is it the best design in drums? Because Tama, Pearl, and everybody imitated. They took their design. Yeah. And all the drums that you see, and you will see then, now, and uh, on their drums. And they still make it. Oh, yeah. DW. It's, a, it's, a, it's all a similar deal what Rogers did. Rogers' designers were top-notch. Absolutely. There's one thing that CBS did. They hired good people in R&D department to produce these wonderful, wonderful hardware. This hardware was incredible. So that was one problem with Swivel. Swivel had the two screws attached and stuff, and some people complained about it, and they switched over to other mounts, which, gosh, friends don't like friends, drill drums and Roger drums, please. You know? (laughs) So, yeah. So they were drilling things and putting things in, which totally devaluate the drums. Sure. But... There were people on the road. What are they going to do? They're on the road. They can't find this, can't find that. They got to send the guy down to the corner, you know, big box, you know, store, and he's got to get a mount and he's got to put it on there so the guy can go on and stage at night. Mm-hmm. You got to do what you got to do. I know some really great drummers that are playing professionally that have had to do that. <laughs> they have had to do that. Yep, yep. What are they going to do? You know? Yeah. And then we know the people that just do it and we go, ah, don't just do it. You know? So they came out with this great lines um, in going in. And to that year, they came in with the uh, with the Pacific Blues, with the Mojave Reds, and and you know, and the uh, the Gold, and and then the Sunburst, going into this into these years, going into Big R, and um, of course, when they did that, they still held on to their uh, Dynasonic, and they held on to their uh, um, they held on to the six and a halfs and the and the fives and everything. They did drop the power tone, which was a very popular drum going into 71 and they changed over to a super 10 super 10 is exactly like a dinosonic, but w- without the frame. And then, so, so much for the, for the eight lug, you know, yeah. which a lot of people loved. So what we're working with is a, is, is maple birch, maple, birch, maple. Okay. Okay. Five ply. Okay. Got it. So we're, we're dealing all with the five ply drums going into the, um, the XP, which is, we're going into basically 1980, 81. And they bring in a, uh, John Sermonero comes in and um, some other folks in, in R&D. And they start manufacturing these beautiful, beautiful maple drums. And beautiful snares as well. Hmm. Snares are maple. Uh, the, the 5 by 14 Dynasonics and Super Tins are maple, which they didn't make very many of those. Yeah. But they experimented with a lot of things. They made they made the naked brass shells, and and uh, these drums were were just amazing, and they sound better than anything in the world. They didn't have re rings on them. Uh, they changed that, going like you know they were still making some maple drums in in the other big R going up to 1978, 79. You know, in that area, 77, mm-hmm. they were making some maple drums, but they dropped the re-rings and then it continued into the, uh, and, uh, no re no re-rings in, inside, but just a, all a maple drum. And these drums are just amazing. Absolutely amazing. They have the aluminum, uh, Tom legs on there, which is fine. They have all the uh, memory lock hardware on them and everything. And these drums were, uh, they had great endorses. Uh, the endorsers were just wonderful. Uh, David Garibaldi and, uh, Ron Tutt, uh, Gina, Shock, Craig Cramp, you know, um, oh gosh, Dixie Dregs. Yeah. Um, Good representation there on the drums, which is a big part of selling drums is people seeing who's playing oh, them and then that catches huge. on. And yeah, big part. Oh of it. my gosh. It's, it's, I mean, top notch folks. And then what happened was, is that Rogers, even we can talk about these drums, Rogers, CBS moved them back and forth, Mexico here, there to Monrovia in the end, you know, back down, you know, it was, it it was crazy. What they were doing is devaluating this company, devaluating the company. 
evaluating the company more and more and more and more and more. Hmm. And then finally, um, oh, in the middle, <laughs> in the middle of the whole thing, they came out with this with this with this series. They call it series two, series two. So, and, and uh, the series two came out right about you know eighty ish, seventy nine, eighty. As a matter of fact, I collect some of the Series 2 drums because they're very interesting. You know why they're so interesting? They're made of plastic. Really? Um, and, uh, oh, yeah. The Series 2 line was actually designed by Dave Donahoe. Okay? Dave Donahoe is an extremely brilliant engineer. And, um, and he also came up a lot with the Memory Lock Series. Cool. Um, and yeah, and he came out with an answer to the imports and it was low cost and, um, uh, but it was, impre- it was, it was a little bulky looking. So, um, and he came out with this, um, and it was lightweight. Okay. And so he came out with this design and, um, and he called it the series two and, uh, and he left right after that. Hmm. Um, what they did was they made this, uh, Series two, they took his design and Rogers made it themselves and they came out with plastic lugs. The only thing on the drum that was steel was the hoops, the tension rods, and knobby hmm. on the uh on the throw off. Wow. That's Everything not good. else was plastic. Everything else was plastic. Wow. And they set this thing up at NAM and it fell apart and they took it and they put it in the back room and uh and that was the end of that. Jeez. And uh, so the shell is plastic. Crazy thing about it, those drums sound pretty good. Really? <laughs> ask me. But, you know, they do. Mm. They sound good. But you can't you can't tighten the tension rock without cracking the lug. Yeah, because it's plastic. Without separating. Because it's plastic. So they came out with this series, and what happened was is that uh, um, uh, Ed Llewellyn, um came into the, uh, he was the division head, the executive, and, uh, and he was really upset about this. So he, he came into the meeting, and he put on a, on a, a sticky pad, one of those sticky things, yeah. and he wrote $1 million on it, like $1 million, and he stuck it to his head. He walked into the meeting, and he said, guys, we have a problem. And he had that million-dollar thing on there, which was the Series 2, <laughs> which they lost all that money. Uh-huh. If they would have just followed what um, Dave Donahoe had originally planned, they probably wouldn't have had that problem because he came up with all this wonderful ideas like the memory lock and stuff, and then they and then they wouldn't listen to him, so he left. Wow. And then that they produced this. Not Dave. They produced this. And they lost some good people over that. And uh, I think what they, the mindset was was we're tired of drums. We can build a guitar, hmm. and we don't need a lot, but 25,000, you know, uh, yeah. fasteners on yeah. a drum set or something, that's a little much. We got, we got a lot of people here. We got a lot of people to feed. Sure. We got a lot of mouths, and, you know, we've got a lot of drums, and these things take up a lot of space, and, you know, we got a lot of room and a lot of big boxes to ship. Yep. Shipping costs a lot of money, you know, so um, these beautiful drums – that um, John Simonero designed and, and up to the end when he turned the lights off in early 85, everything shut down and, uh, and was no more. Hmm. Then, uh, and then, um, of course, uh, another company came out was called Iron Music and they, they wanted to, you know, fake the stuff and, you know, they put a Rogers badge on, on, a, on a drum set and they were, trying to do that. And Yamaha uh, came out with their wannabe brand, which they called the Prospector, which is, mm. a, you know, close to like a sunlight drum set, you know, and, and, uh, and, and, you know, now, now you think about that, you think about that, about where they are now. And then you think about Covington, family, construction, good people, love the drums, ladies sitting around building drums and talking about what's going on in town. You know, yeah. I could see Aunt B, you know, I see Mayberry, exactly. you know, that's yes. what this sounds like, you know, you go from a really quiet town that 
everybody dedicated their lives there yeah. to Rogers to, to something where it's not that everybody's dedicating their lives. Cause I'm sure the people they were dedicating their lives. It's what the people in the brass are dedicated to. They're dedicated more to their guitars than they were dedicated to the wonderful legacy of Roger Strums and Brooke Mays, uh, uh, Mr. Cowan, he, he gave it a good whirl and he got, he was making some nice drums. He, he, he did the best he could to, to, to do something for Rogers and, and just went totally bankrupt. So basically in 1999, Brooke Mays, when they, uh, when they took over their time with Rogers and they made some really beautiful drums and he really gave it a try. I mean, the drums were nice and, and some people kind of confuse, um, Brooklyn Maze drums with Island Music, but they're not. It's a nice shell. Uh, the uh, lugs are really, really nice. The beaver tail lugs, you know, they're really great drums. He even made a uh, a double bass pedal, and and um, you know everything was really, really nice. Uh, they came out with the snares. Uh, they had uh, brass snares, and they had uh, steel snares, and uh, they had a maple snare that was really nice. It was crispy. I have played those, and I have them here in the collection. Cool. And some of the wraps that they had. Um, they call it the RD2000 or RD500, which light blue and black and natural. There was like a maple color, blonde. Um, and then they had their own line of symbols with Rogers on it. Uh, what was real nice was their, uh, they had a real nice Rogers drum throne. And it's similar to the drum thrones now with the bicycle type drum throne. Yeah. You know, that's really comfortable, yeah, those big are and wide. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. I mean, it was a good era. But the thing was, he went bankrupt. Hmm. And I don't know exactly, but you're probably in the, in the mid-2000s is, is when all that happened. And um, Yamaha got the company from him, and then that's when Yamaha just kind of ran it right straight in the ground. He, it, you could just imagine, uh, you know, um, you're doing a parachute, and you're, and you're like, your first time you've ever done a parachute jump, yeah. and you're screaming all the way down. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's basically how Rogers was with them, with the Yamaha. It was like you, me jumping out and and uh, having accidents all the way and screaming at the same time. Wow. Ah! So I finally hit the bottom. What happened? What what went wrong? It, it was just mismanaged or it was just they were focused on their own stuff and Rogers was kind of an afterthought? Lack of quality. Lack of quality. Got it. Yeah, just lack of quality. And, and, and that was the end of Rogers. Everybody was like, that's it. Hmm. You know, it's all over. It's all over. You know, last time I saw a Rogers drum set and it, it said prospector on it, $225. I remember one set up at a music store and it had the Rogers logo on it. And every, the only thing on that drum set that was just worth crying over was just the Rogers logo, just sadly <laughs> positioned on the bass drum head. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and, and then again, you go back to family people talking a great town Mayberry, you know, and B again, you know, let's go fishing and parties and good time. And then you go to Dayton, Joe Thompson passes away. Then all of a sudden they just scoop everything up and let's go to Florida, you know? Yeah. And then it was a move nine times, nine times they moved, nine times they moved in between all that, all that time. And this is what happens from January of 1984, basically to March of 1985, the Fender Rogers Rose division of CBS Musical was for sale. It became evident that CBS executives at the real estate could yield more than they could ever realistically hope to make in a profit. Hmm. Jeez. So they had all those losses. Yeah. In 1984, literally, there was a for sale sign out front of the building for sale. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So in March, CBS, March of 1985, and they purchased that. But, um, yeah, everything just, yeah, it was all over. But Rogers is back, though, now, correct? So after all of that, uh, the Yamaha, the Brooks Mays Music Company, and then Yamaha got it, and it just kind of, I guess, fizzled out. But Rogers in 2013, I believe, got sold again. So Rogers is back now. Correct. This is a well. There was a, an individual that uh, there's, there were some people that a guy that owned the name of Rogers, okay, and and uh, and then that name uh, yeah, uh, was bought again by Joe Chin, okay, and that again is Reliance Company, 
Reliance Company owned the Rogers name, which is ironically, Island, Island, uh, they are the same company that one time owns Island Music hmm. that made the other, the, the other Big R. Yeah. You know, and tried to replicate Big R. So they uh, owned the name of Rogers and, um, and still do. So then all of a sudden, about three years ago, us folks, there's folks, you know, there's a few Rogers drums groups. I have one called Rogers Drums USA, which is a Myrtis group, and along with some other groups, Covington, and there's Rogers Dinosonic, there's a Rogers Drums, and, and uh, Rogers Drums Group 2, and then there's yeah. uh, the uh, Rogers Drum Owners Group, and a great group too. And, you know, there's a few groups here on, on Facebook. And um, all of us, it was the biggest scuttle you've ever seen. It was like, all of a sudden, like, people running outside to see if there's a UFO, you know, <laughs> yeah. because all of a sudden popped up on everybody's feed, the return of the legend, Roger's drums. <laughs> and we were like, what? Yeah. What's going on here? Aliens do exist. And all of a sudden people were putting it up and it disappeared. So I was, we were all thinking, could you just imagine the person that just put up that thing just for a test? And then they see all the groups light up. Yeah. What in the world they're thinking? They're like, what did you do that for? It's your fault. No, it's not my fault. It's your fault. You don't want to put it on. You put it on. Yeah. <laughs> you know? um, what was amazing is it was true that this is what was going on. Wonderful Steve Maxwell was helping out, uh, you know, giving some advice on building the, uh, the first snares coming out. The wonderful guy. But uh, that came up and then, we had uh, went to the Chicago drum show because I heard basically that Rogers may be there. And I was like, wow. So I went to the Chicago drum show that year and the snare was there and Steve Maxwell's booth. I took a video of it and I actually hugged the snare. <laughs> <laughs> That's I hugged great. that snare and uh, we ordered a snare along with uh, another friend, Paul Hollis, Jack McFeeders guys in the group and we put our money down on one and got the first few numbers that came out. And then I had the wonderful, 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 amazing pleasure. The guys behind Rogers, the new Rogers were there. And I got the opportunity to meet these guys. And I got to say one thing. These guys have an amazing passion for Rogers. That's great. Incredible passion, incredible passion. And they are doing this right doing this right. I'm telling you, this is just amazing. And um, we are blessed beyond to have such wonderful guys that are building these drums, that are making these wonderful, beautiful drums, the way the bearing edges are made. Yes, a lot of products are made over there. Mm -hmm. Yes, we do know that. Mm -hmm. The drums are being built, not assembled. They are being assembled, but they're also being built here in California by Bill Denimore. Yep, of pork pie. And he yes. is doing... And he is amazing, wonderful person, great, great person to many, 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 many people. He knows drums, and he's building these drums, and he is assembling these drums, and every attention is given to everything. Yes, there has been some headaches at the beginning due to some hardware, but not, not nothing to do with Bill. But, you know, in some hardware, there's some this or that's or Maybe, you know, when you're making things, some of the frames of this or the wires aren't right. Yes. But you know something? The guys at Big Bang Distribution, Bob Kasha, steps up and makes every single thing right. Everything right. These guys are just as passionate about building Rogers drums as we are playing and enjoying what they're doing and what has been done in the past, starting with the Joe Thompson legacy. Hmm. It seems like it's gone full circle. It is full circle. And the most amazing thing about this, Joe Thompson was family. What's Bill Didamore? Family. Family man, yeah. It's amazing for somebody to really get behind something and pay attention to every drum that comes out of that shop. I think anyone listening to this with both you and with Poe can tell that Roger's fans are passionate. And like you said, with Bill, with with. Anyone involved with Rogers, you need to have that passion to match what your community has. So, um, yes. Rogers has a That's special, right. special group 
Um, and I found that out at the Chicago show when we spent some time together and from talking online and yeah. talking on the phone a few times. On the before, couch. On the couch. <laughs> so yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to highly recommend, as we just kind of wrapped up the history, I highly recommend that everyone finds Jeff. Jeff Burke. B-U-R-K-E. Yeah. You see a picture of myself and my wonderful daughter. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And you're you're a good guy. I can just tell you that you and Poe are both Thank great, great guys you. and um and have been Oh, he's wonderful. Absolutely yeah. fantastic person. Yeah. Yes. And for someone like me who is learning more about Rogers, you guys are just thinking you're saying, Come on in and we'll teach you about it and then you can become a Rogers guy. We're still learning. Sure. I've got a lot to learn. I I mean, you know, I, I you know, at sixty or sixty going into sixty one next year, you know, I wish I was younger, but you know, hey, I'm young at heart. You know, I might not remember it a date or two on something, but I do remember one thing that Rogers drum started in a good, good place. And it's in a good place now. Yeah. Well, I'm proud to be from Ohio and uh, be a part of the, the, you know, Hey, that's right. Yeah. So <laughs> Jeff, man, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to just go through the latter half of Rogers life with us. And, um, thank you. Thanks for being here with us today. We're just very grateful that you asked us to do this. And um, I know that, that myself being passionate for this, there are a lot of other people that are as well. And you hit that right on the nose. I just want to thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. And, um, and this is a great show. And uh, folks, I'm glad everybody can tune in to this. And we want to thank you from the bottom of our heart for what you do for everybody as well. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you, Jeff. Yep. So before we wrap up completely here, let's hop back in with Poe Shy and learn about the Rogers homecoming that's happening in Covington, Ohio. Uh, you can find uh, information. Uh, Mike Outset, Poe's Percussion, is the event sponsor. And you can find the, the date of April 25th, 2020. I know that sounds like a long time away from <laughs> it now. It really does, yeah, but it's not. It does, but it's not. We're going to have a planning session coming up here in August with, uh, in Covington. And, um, you know, last year we had attendance, and the show went great. We had, uh, you know, our VIPs had a, a jam with a, a blues band, and it was a very, very enjoyable time. Um, there's going to be uh, details on the Rogers USA as well as the Rogers drum page, as well as the Rogers drum owners forum. We posted on all the Rogers groups, uh, Rogers on a Sonic group, uh, all the Facebook groups, including my page, Covington Drummers, and uh, just keep an eye out for it. That's great. I appreciate it, Poe. Thanks for being here today. Thanks, brother. Talk to you soon. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History, and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning. This is a Gwyn Sound Podcast. <laughs>